world, I'm John Bruni and you're listening to Strategic On, your window to all things security and foreign affairs. When the Trump administration was elected back in 2016, the incoming US president made no bones of the fact that he was not a fan of multilateral institutions, which he blamed for having robbed the United States workforce of its jobs, most of which were outsourced to countries with far lower wages and salaries. Indeed, Trump went as far as accusing former US presidents, but especially Obama, for having pandered to foreign internationalist interests at the expense of US workers. Now that avowed internationalist Joe Biden is in the White House, he has promised to return the US to pre-Trump days by strengthening international multilateral institutions. Will he succeed? Will this be in the interest of the American workforce? And how will Biden's promises affect a world still shocked by the disruptions of the Trump era and COVID-19? Furthermore, how will 1990s style multilateralism cope with emerging nationalism around the world with calls to do more to rebuild national sovereign capability? To discuss this and more tonight from Paris, we're joined by Nicolas Michelon, Nicholas is founder and managing director of the Asia Intelligence Advisory and editor of AsiaPowerWatch.com. Nicholas, welcome to Strategicom. Thank you very much for having me, John. Thank you, David. So let's start off with an easy one. How disruptive was President Donald J. Trump to international multilateralism, or were these multilateral frameworks already on their way out of fashion? Uh, a great question to start with. Uh, I think um, what uh, President Trump did is really uh, put an end to something that was on the way out already, that was dying out slowly. I mean, we, we can clearly see that uh, from, uh, from 2001, when China joined the WTO, uh, things have been starting to unravel. Um, and um, the whole world has been realizing that um, the whole dream of having a country like China change its ways, change its political system, change its own economic system by just joining this great worldwide party that is globalization, uh, at least the old fashioned way, I would say the 1.0, uh, that has become a major disappointment very rapidly. And uh, we've realized that uh, it was turning very quickly into a zero sum game. Uh, if you wanted to make money in China, where well, you had pretty much to close down uh, whatever you had in Australia, whatever you had in France, whatever you had in the US to reopen elsewhere. So you take, uh, you create one job somewhere by destroying another job elsewhere. Um, so I think what President Trump uh, did was just basically make uh, this realization uh, very obvious to everyone, for everyone to see. And that's where, that's where he started basically uh, you know, uh, uh, kicking, uh, kicking the, 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 the hornet's nest and uh, trying to destroy all the, the old uh, 1.0 multilateral system. Uh, I think this was uh, necessary. Somebody had to do it. Obviously, President Trump did it in his own very special way with those very inflammatory tweets and uh, his uh, very uh, aggressive uh, negotiation style. Some would even call it not even a negotiation in many cases. But I think it was very necessary. And what the Biden administration will be able to do uh, from now on, actually, uh, will capitalize on what President Trump has done in the in the previous four years. Uh, I do not uh, buy um, the official opposition between uh, President Trump versus President Obama or President Biden versus President Trump. I think there is a continuation in U.S. policy. Um, uh, President Obama already started uh, the pivot to Asia Pacific, which President Trump continued with his own Indo-Pacific. Uh, concept and President Biden will build on that and he will be able to recreate new alliances, I think smaller ones, uh, more regional ones, uh, but alliances that make much more sense uh, in terms of US interests. From a practical perspective, Trump replaced the North American Free Trade Association or NAFTA with the US-Mexico-Canada agreement, which he claimed was a colossal victory for the American worker, was it? Uh, I think, in theory, it could be. Uh, the idea uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, President Trump in doing so, and this is precisely what the, the Chinese are trying to do as well, is to make sure that in every single trade and economic negotiation, the balance of power is clearly in, uh, in America's favor. So they are breaking up the old multilateral agreements, U.S., 
versus uh, much of the Latin American continent. And they're going for much smaller trade agreements, less countries, smaller countries in, in many cases. And every time the US totally wins the balance of power, it is in their favor and they can impose different, uh, different conditions, which is exactly what the, what the Chinese have been trying to do as well. Uh, so I think in theory, um, it puts the US in a better, on a stronger footing uh, um, uh, when talking to uh, to Mexico, when talking to other Latin American countries, especially uh, in terms of slowing down the development of what we call maquilladoras, uh, so those uh, those uh, factories right at the border uh, that have been attracting a lot of the jobs uh, away from the U.S., uh, but they are specializing in terms of you know production for the U.S. market. So I think that the what is at stake for the U.S. is to slow that process down, uh, to do as much reshoring of industries as possible. It will not be entirely uh, doable uh, to go back to the situation of uh, of the 1980s. But at least for high value added services, high value added manufacturing, uh, there is a very clear possibility that the U.S. Uh, can reshore some of it, uh, but for that to happen, they needed to renegotiate many of the trade agreements. And that is exactly what President Trump has done with this. Uh, if I was a US blue collar worker, uh, I would welcome that development. And I would, uh, I would be convinced that now Biden administration can build on this uh, and make it uh, make the, basically the, the US market uh, more welcoming to their own companies. Thank you. Nicholas, if they manage to move some of this production back to the US, are we in a difficult point where right at the point where potentially the jobs return, we also potentially enter the era where we're more likely to have a very expensive factory full of robots doing the work rather than people? Or is this a case that there is enough political will to create jobs rather than just creating production in the US? Um I think what is at stake is not so much the creation of jobs, because as you very rightly said, this is coming, this, uh, yeah. uh, this wish to reshore industries is coming at a time where uh, robotization is, uh, is, is, um, is increasing very fast, the implementation is very increasing very fast. So what is at stake is really just to bring back the production home, uh, to bring back basically uh, a tax base uh, uh, a corporate tax base that is much higher to keep uh, research and development at home as much as possible. I mean, we've seen that much of the trade war that uh, President Trump has started uh, is about uh, the tech war, actually. It's about protecting R&D. It's about uh, keeping uh, competitors uh, away from uh, um, from. Uh, uh, from a uh, uh, US R&D. Um, so this is really what is at stake. Uh, I do agree that uh, uh, many blue collar workers may be disappointed at not seeing so many uh, factory jobs being created back, but at least at the, at the country level, if value added is brought back home, if R&D is better protected, that would already be a major victory. Go to South and Latin America, um, the Mercosur trade agreement doesn't seem to be doing as well as adherents had hoped. What went wrong with this trade agreement and is it terminal? Uh, I think it is uh, definitely terminal. Uh, what is wrong is that many of the, the countries uh, that are parts and are actually the pillars of uh, Mercosur, for example, uh, they are stuck in what economists call uh, uh, the medium income trap. So basically, uh, those countries have been able to go up the value added ladder for a while, but now they're being stuck. They're being stuck for many reasons. Uh, corruption is one major reason. Uh, corruption has been basically distorting uh, much of the very natural uh, mechanisms whereby um, uh, funds are allocated, resources are allocated to the right industries and to the industries that make sense. Because of corruption, there's been a distortion in these flows of allocations. Uh, an example of Brazil, uh, where you've had uh, a tremendous amounts of uh, public funds being directed to uh, companies like Petrobras, um, and which didn't make any economic sense and which led to this uh, major scandal that keeps uh, basically uh, bringing down uh, leaders after leaders uh, in, in, the, in the country. Um, you have a, a country, uh, for example, in Asia that has been escaping this middle income trap uh, and which is uh, South Korea. South Korea has been very well able to uh, go up the, the value ladder, uh, become a leader in many industries and making sure that 
public and private funds were allocated properly to the right companies. And in many cases, uh, the allocation stopped when it, made, when it became apparent to the Korean government that uh, uh, supporting a certain industry or a certain company didn't make sense. Unfortunately, this is not happening enough in Latin America, and it's making sure basically that those countries are being stopped. And another reason that uh, many of those uh, pillars of Mercosur uh, are not able to take this trade agreement any further is their over-reliance on natural resources, on the export of natural resources. Um, we will probably talk about uh, India later. It is also uh, an issue with India. And it's making sure that these countries basically uh, keep um, uh, maintaining uh, a negative trade balance with many of their largest trade partners, a negative uh, balance of payment with their many trade partners. Uh, when you look at the trade balance of Brazil with China or Argentina with China, uh, it is uh, very much in the disfavor of Brazil and Argentina because they depend way too much on the exports of those natural resources uh, with very low value added and they depend on the imports of the very high value added uh, uh, manufactured goods from uh, those trade partners. So uh, Latin American countries in that sense will have to reinvent themselves. And I do believe that uh, now is the right time because now they have two types of partners to talk to. They have, of course, the US historically, historically since the Monroe Doctrine, uh, but they also have China now that they are able to talk to. So they are finally in a position where they can technically on many sectors uh, play one against the other ask for uh, you know ask for an offer uh, from one partner um, if the offer is not good they can turn to another one a good example is colombia colombia is um, uh, an historical ally of the us for many reasons um, but it is very impressive to see how deep and how easily china has been penetrating uh, the colombian economic fabric especially on very um, on very uh, sensitive sectors such as infrastructure, such as utilities. Um, and it is not something that is normal uh, to happen in Colombia. This is something that you would expect to see happening in Ecuador, uh, in Brazil, in Argentina. Uh, I'm not even talking about Venezuela or Mexico. Uh, but in Colombia, it's very surprising to see that the leaders, economic and political leaders, are very, um, are very happy to open up to a, a partner uh, like China in spite of the pressure they're getting from Washington. Uh, the metro of Bogota was won by a Chinese company uh, in, the, in the, the prefecture of Antioquia, which is a prefecture around the city of Medellin, which is the second largest city. And uh, now the major uh, utility provider uh, is being uh, managed uh, in conjunction with uh, China Three Gorges. Uh, the operator of the largest uh, dam in China. Uh, so it, it is, um, I think Latin America in that sense is really at, um, at, a, uh, at a crossroads and they are finally able to uh, play on both influences. And you also have like some third party powers like the European Union, which is trying to come back in terms of influence. You have India, uh, which is uh, moving quite aggressively uh, uh, on, the, on the healthcare uh, sector. So I think, um, I'm not sure it is a turn that Latin America will take will take successfully, but at least they are being presented with better opportunities now. Mm. Uh, David, just to go back to talking about Colombia, it's very interesting. When we were talking to the Colombian ambassador, mm -hmm. he made that point that they're feeling very confident about dealing with Americans on some things and China on the other, and reaching out to make new partnerships with other countries when the opportunities come up. What do you think makes the Colombians different in that they're leading this? Because they really, for security reasons, have been the closest to the Americans, you know, of all their neighbours for a long time and worked most closely and probably been the most trusted partner. So for them to actually get the confidence to deal with different people is so atypical to Latin American history. It is. Uh, I, I think two things. Uh, first of all, uh, the Chinese are starting to do in Colombia, and they're obviously uh, uh, having some success in that respect. They're starting to do what they've been doing in other Latin American countries, which is uh, uh, spreading their influence uh, in all um, basically in all uh, stratas of, uh, of leadership in Colombia, be it on the political side or the economic side. Um, the Chinese Colombian uh, Chamber of Commerce is being very aggressive. Um, there is opening of Confucius Institutes in virtually all the universities 
uh, in Colombia. And uh, Latin Americans in general, and Colombians in particular, have also, in spite of their uh, strategic alignment on Washington, they've also been very uh, disappointed at the US economic involvement in their country, uh, especially on the infrastructure side. Infrastructure is a major issue for Colombia. Uh, I was there last month. Uh, I spent three weeks in Colombia uh, on a business trip. You have to realize that to go from Bogota to Medellin, it's a 40 minute flight. Uh, it's a six or seven hours drive. Um, there is no railroad in Colombia. Uh, the roads are terrible. If you want to, if, if you had the idea of driving from Medellin to Cali, uh, it would take you forever. Um, so the idea for the Colombians is really to put that part of their uh, development history behind and saying, okay, now we have another partner coming on the continent, which is China, which is able to activate uh, uh, infrastructure projects much faster, which offer financing options, which are much more, I would say, exotic. Uh, and we could come back to what exotic <laughs> means in many cases, but at least um, it enables countries like Colombia to get out of the, of the good old uh, IMF, World Bank, uh, Inter-American Development Bank uh, type, of, uh, type of, uh, uh, of financial structures uh, and the Chinese, as you know, as we've seen in, uh, in Venezuela, in Argentina, in Ecuador, the Chinese are nas uh, not asking for changes in uh, economic policy uh, as, a, uh, as a result of their financing. They're not asking for uh, democratic elections. They're not asking for anything like this. Uh, they pay themselves uh, 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 on the project in case the country is not able to pay back, uh, but they're not asking for change of policy. So it is making it much uh, uh, easier for those countries to accept. Um, Nicholas, just on the Colombian aspect and actually moving into the whole Latin American area, in infrastructure has always been a thing that bedeviled many of the Latin American states and arguably their lack of proper national development has been hampered because of that lack of infrastructure. But now that they have access to Chinese capital and have the capacity to play, you know, the great powers off each other to get as much as they can for themselves. How do you think this is as a transformative aspect of Latin America as a whole, but maybe even Colombia specifically? Um, uh, I think it's, um, first of all, uh, it's speeding up. Uh, development of, of the very the direly needed infrastructures in many of those countries. The Chinese are able to much, to move much faster than multilateral organizations. Uh, if, even if you compare uh, European uh, official development aid, uh, development assistance programs, uh, they're moving much more slowly than the Chinese are able to. Uh, we don't have in Europe the same firepower in terms of uh, in terms of the amounts we can pledge to those uh, to those projects and we are very much hindered by our uh, political criteria uh, we need to make sure that uh, the projects are not happening in a country that is that we deem undemocratic we need to make sure that the projects respect um, uh, socially responsible and environmentally uh, responsible practices. Uh, the Chinese are not so regarding in that sense. Uh, it, it's actually it's a double-edged sword for them uh, because we are seeing now um, a, a lot of discontent in many uh, Latin American communities that's very apparent in Ecuador um, uh, over the negative environmental and social impact of Chinese investments, especially in mining, especially in utilities uh, and infrastructures. So it's a double-edged sword. I think the Chinese are starting to realize this. Uh, it's obvious that they are talking about uh, actually uh, implementing socially and uh, environmentally responsible standards uh, within everything Belt and Road Initiative related. And they are actually proposing to set up their own standards in that respect. But they have scored um, a lot of very negative uh, points in that term. And that's an opportunity for the US to, to, to step back. Um, one example, uh, two weeks before President Trump uh, left the White House, he had uh, one of the two US uh, uh, development aid uh, agencies sign an agreement with, uh, with the Republic of Ecuador. And the, the, the agreement says that this US aid agency will take over everything that Ecuador owns to Chinese companies in exchange for Ecuador closing up on uh, Chinese involvement in 5G uh, development in Ecuador. Yeah. Uh, this uh, disagreement 
uh, I think uh, could be um, uh, a sign of things to come. It could be a new model of a development aid uh, from the US. And on the same day that the US signed this agreement with Ecuador, uh, the same agency signed a memorandum of understanding with the Japanese uh, development aid uh, organization. And that MOU says that US and Japan will collaborate on development aid programs in Latin America, and not only on infrastructure, they will also collaborate on new technologies, on uh, 5G development, et cetera. So I think uh, we are at a juncture uh, in a third, uh, I would say third countries like uh, Latin American countries, but that's also true in Africa. Uh, we are at a juncture. The Chinese have been making tremendous progress over the past 15 years. They've made a lot of mistakes. Uh, it's actually good that they didn't have any competition because they were allowed to make all the mistakes they could possibly make uh, with that, without having any competition. So now those, uh, those regions, Latin America, Africa, uh, they have a way of pitting one against the other now. Uh, they have enough uh, arguments to keep the Chinese at bay when it's necessary. They have enough arguments to try and push the Americans and possibly Europeans if we wake up one day. Uh, to be uh, more uh, to be more competitive, uh, but at least um, um, it's a kind of a reset. It's it's very possible that we are entering a period of a reset in relations, uh, and if those countries played played their cards well, uh, it could actually play in their favor. In the East Asian theater, we have the old stalwart ASEAN, founded in 1967, along with the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation in 1989 the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, CP, TPP, God, I got that right, formerly the TPP, that's a lot of T's and P's, in, 19, uh, in 2018, and of course then we've got the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP, in 2020. Of course, that's a lot of acronyms, and for those involved, it's also a lot of bureaucratic gravy. How important are they, and why should we care? They are very important and we should very much care because this piling up of uh, trade agreements, uh, and you will notice that more and more of them are regional trade agreements, uh, not so much global. Uh, the piling up of these agreements uh, shows us that we are entering into a new period of what we could call plurilateralism. Uh, the, 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 the age of milk, the good old multilateral uh, world uh, is definitely dying if it's not already dead. Uh, plurilateralism is very important because it enables all the, um, all the major powers uh, that control and that weigh uh, heaviest in those agreements. It en enables them basically to break up all the alliances and to make sure, as I said earlier, that every single time uh, they control the balance of power, that the balance of power is clearly in their favor. Uh, it, talking about RCEP, for example, uh, RCEP was launched at the initiative of ASEAN because ASEAN, as you, uh, as you, as you noticed, uh, has been dying out. Uh, the latest coup in Myanmar is showing that ASEAN is not doing uh, its job, it's not playing its role, it's not bringing any solution to crises like uh, the military coup in, uh, in Myanmar. So ASEAN had to reinvent itself. Uh, the thing is, in this day and age, they cannot reinvent itself without incorporating China into it. And as soon as you incorporate China, well, basically you have one huge elephant in the room that controls everything, that controls uh, the whole narrative, that controls the negotiation process. Um, but they had to do it. And for, uh, for China, uh, it's one way of counterbalancing CPTPP. CPTPP uh, is called like this since the US uh, uh, pulled out. Under the, president, under the Trump administration, but it's, it is actually uh, um, in discussion that the US might try and rejoin at some point in some form uh, CPTPP. So China had to move fast to create something uh, uh, in opposition to CPTPP. Uh, it's even more um, urgent for China to do so since uh, some European countries have actually expressed their interest in joining CPTPP, the UK, the post-Brexit UK have expressed interest uh, in joining this, uh, even though it is not uh, a trans-Pacific nation. So the idea is really to break up the old alliances, to create new alliances uh, according to your wishes, according to your size, according to your interests. Uh, the interesting point about RCEP is that Japan is also part of it. And Japan being uh, one of the pillars of Quad, uh, one of the main actors of trying to contain China uh, in the region uh, could not afford not to be in RCEP. It is, uh, I, I, would, um, I would draw a parallel between RCEP and 
uh, one of the most important dinners in town. Uh, even if you don't want to go to that dinner in town because it's a nice football game that night, well, you know that your main competitor is going to be there. So you have to go. You have to go. You, so you put your tie on and you have to go because you cannot afford to have that guy being alone with all your other partners and being the only one who talks to your partners. You have to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, one interesting thing is that Japan is joining that party, uh, even though they are doing so reluctantly, but they're also uh, organizing their own party on the side, which is RSCI, the, the Resilient Supply Chain Initiative, which they are launching with Australia and with India. And they're launching really at the same time. And the idea is at the same time that they're entering into RCEP with China and other countries, they are going to try and build another type of trade alliance uh, focusing on relying less on China manufacturing, uh, being able to uh, replace uh, uh, China factories with, with factories elsewhere, Vietnam, uh, Cambodia, Indonesia, wherever, possibly India as well. Um, so the idea is that you go into one alliance that you cannot afford not to go into, not because you want it, because just because you cannot afford not to, but at the same time, you're starting something on the side that's basically going to be competing with it uh, just to hedge, uh, to hedge your risk. Uh, the Japanese have been uh, uh, allocating a lot of resources. The Japanese parliament uh, uh, budgeted uh, several billion US dollars worth of, uh, of uh, financial assistance to Japanese companies who want to move out of China back to Japan. Uh, so they're doing all this at the same time. So they're sending the clear message to China. We're getting on board on this RCEP thing because we, we don't have the choice. We cannot let you be the only economic power in our set. But at the same time, we're building many things on the side. And then you have Quad. Quad, which is technically uh, started as a strategic alliance, more as a security alliance. And since the latest virtual summit uh, that they've had uh, uh, earlier last month, we are seeing that they're talking more and more about economic issues. They're talking about you know, health, uh, health, uh, healthcare uh, co uh, cooperation. They're talking about cooperation uh, in new technologies. So Quad also is slowly morphing into something much more economically and technologically oriented uh, from what it used to be uh, initially, which was just a security alliance. Mm. David? It's very interesting to hear the extent to which so many people are realizing you do a good deal, you do a bad deal, and you make sure you're connected in everything. You know, when we were working on a big uh, report for defense, it was fascinating reading the early Indian language about multi-alignment. And it's kind of interesting now that the Indians talk about multi-alignment less and everyone else is just doing it but not giving it a name. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, well, India has been uh, has been uh, uh, um, cultivating mm. this uh, this uh, strategic ambiguity position that they've always had pretty much since independence. Mm. But now uh, the, the, a lot of people are putting pressure on them to go beyond that strategic ambiguity and start in and start choosing sides. Uh, they have been resisting that pressure so far. They still want to keep good relations with Russia, for example. Uh, they do. They do not. Uh, want to uh, go into a full confrontation, or at least they want to postpone it as much as possible with China. Uh, but I, I think what the Biden administration will have to do is to tone down on the Trump uh, rhetoric when it comes to India. Trump was trying to basically pull uh, India very aggressively on the US side. I think the Biden administration will have to be smarter than this. They will, they will have to take into account that for India, strategic ambiguity is paramount to its strategic posture. Uh, it is part of their DNA, of their strategic DNA. And uh, I think Europe, in that sense, uh, is kind of showing the way. Uh, the latest agreement we've signed uh, between, the, between the EU and India uh, last weekend in Porto uh, is an indication of this. Uh, we are not trying to push for a full-blown trade agreement with India. We know that India is not ready for this. Uh, the economic structure, as I said earlier, of India does not allow this, which is why they pulled out of uh, negotiation to join RCEP. It would have been a disaster for the Indian ba trade balance to join RCEP. But at least what the European are doing is are saying that we should focus on co collaborating, cooperating uh, on uh, uh, um, uh, technological issues, R&D, things like this, but not opening up trade altogether. We know that you're not ready for this. Uh, it would not be uh, something that uh, 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 Modi uh, would want. Uh, his, own, uh, his own ideology is very opposed to this. He's very much in favor of a, a kind of, of more uh, kind of autarkic uh, type of uh, 
uh, posture for, for India. So we have to take it very slowly uh, when it comes to India. And we have to remember that it is uh, the largest democracy in the world, meaning that decision-making process in India is very long, is very tedious. We are seeing uh, the negative result of it in this, uh, this COVID-19 pandemic. Much, much of the disaster that's uh, uh, unfolding right now is because India is uh, such a large federal state. A lot of decisions are not made necessarily in Delhi. They're made in, uh, in, in each and every state. So we have to, to tread very carefully because India could very uh, well uh, uh, clam up if we try to pull too aggressively uh, on them to join too many agreements, to join too many groupings. Mm. The African Union is quite ambitious in what it wants um, in terms of wielding the continent of 54 states into one market. Is the AU being way too ambitious considering these two salient facts? Firstly, most African countries have, un uh, have underdeveloped and underperforming economies. And two, most of those economies are dominated by one critical external actor, the People's Republic of China. Um, not being uh, an Africa specialist, I will tread carefully uh, on, on this issue. But I, I would say that um, uh, Africa is the theater of a very uh, aggressive and probably unprecedented uh, information warfare. Uh, uh, from uh, both the, the People's Republic of China and, uh, and the US. Unfortunately, Europe is not doing much in that respect. Uh, and I'm, uh, I find that pretty, uh, pretty sad because uh, we're supposed to have uh, uh, a kind of, kind of an advance on those countries in terms of influence, uh, which we have lost uh, very quickly. This information warfare, it's extremely aggressive and it's really uh, trying to, uh, to pull uh, the African Union uh, in one clear direction, which is turn your back on uh, ex-colonial uh, powers. Uh, it hasn't worked for you. They've been exploiting you. Uh, and we are offering a different deal. Um, one interesting example is Zimbabwe. Uh, Zimbabwe, under President Mugabe, was playing, basically betting everything uh, on China, on the China relations. They even went as far as making the Jeminbi uh, an official currency for uh, trade exchange in, in Zimbabwe. And we're seeing that in spite of this, the Chinese were not opposed to, uh, uh, to uh, Robert Mugabe leaving power, uh, to having him put under house, uh, house arrest. Uh, so it's showing that even the Chinese are understanding that they cannot go too far in terms of uh, supporting just anyone in Africa who lets them do business there. And God knows that uh, President Mugabe let them do a lot in his own country. Uh, they cannot go too far because uh, uh, local populations are turning against China. Uh, if you look at some of the latest opinion polls uh, in most African countries on what the opinion is uh, in terms of uh, Chinese investments in their country, Chinese involvements in infrastructure, Chinese involvement in politics, uh, the opinions have been uh, turning very negative, extremely negative. Then there is another problem, which is the currency problem in Africa. Uh, much of uh, French-speaking Africa is still stuck with uh, their own, uh, uh, with their own uh, common currency, uh, and it's really not working out for them. Uh, there is a lot of pressure uh, in civil society uh, among uh, business elites uh, to get rid of, uh, of this currency and to go into something that would allow them to do much more trade, much more easily with China. So Africa is really, uh, uh, you know, at the uh, in the middle of this uh, information warfare about influence, about currency, about uh, colonization, uh, what's uh, you know the all the um, uh, the, the all, everything that's been uh, uh, happening since colonization, the Chinese are playing on it, but now they're starting to tone down that type of rhetoric and basically approaching uh, uh, African nations as if the West did not exist. So it's it's very interesting. And then just like in Latin America. You have what I would call third players like Japan, like South Korea, like India, who are coming back uh, because they were never totally absent from Africa. It just went under the radar because the amounts of money and the history they have with the continent uh, is not as big. Uh, but they are coming back. They are proposing uh, uh, development aid uh, programs which make much more sense uh, to Africa. So in, in a way, the situation in Africa is very similar to the situation that we've described earlier in Latin America. Uh, it, it is a time for African countries uh, 
to uh, to be able to play once one against the other. And in that sense, I would say medium powers like Japan, like South Korea, like India, possibly, hopefully, uh, like the European Union, uh, could get back. Uh, 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 in the forefront. Uh, for the European Union, what's at stake is really uh, for all our countries to collaborate in terms of uh, official uh, development assistance. Right now, uh, the French official, uh, the French ODA strategy is very much in competition with the German ODA strategy, with the Spanish ODA strategy. Uh, there's no common front. Uh, I'm not particularly pro uh, Brussels, but if we're going to keep uh, working uh, as a group, then on those, uh, on those issues, we definitely have to move together because Agence Française de Développement on its own, it's not big enough to compete with the US or with, uh, or with China. Same for the Germans, same for the Spaniards, same for the Italians. Um, so it is what is at stake right now. Okay, now speaking of Europe, why do you think they've conceded so much ground to China in Africa? Considering that you know, many European states, as you rightly say, retain very deep ties to Africa due to their respective colonial histories. Has Europe kicked a strategic own goal in order to fulfill a woke political agenda? Uh, I do believe that you're putting this uh, very, <laughs> very nicely. <laughs> um, uh, I think since 1945, um, basically the the, the whole uh, the whole narrative uh, in Europe itself uh, by European elites is that uh, uh, it is pretty much all our fault uh, that we need to apologize. Uh, apologies have been made uh, a lot and apologies through uh, speeches, through uh, financial help, through reparations in many cases. Uh, the idea, uh, I think uh, you could summarize it uh, in this way. Um, when will the European Union and when will European countries in general uh, be proud of what they've built again and when will they again try to project power everybody else is doing it but europe uh, i think in that sense we've become the useful idiots uh, of uh, of globalization um, and this has been a perfect a fantastic opportunity for the likes of china for the likes of the us uh, i've worked in asia for 15 years and when i would talk about this uh, with Japanese people, Chinese, wherever, uh, many of them were saying, we don't understand what Europe is doing in terms, of, uh, in terms of political and economic influence. It's good for us, it's one less competitor, uh, but why are you doing this? Why are you, uh, why are you not fighting us more? Why are you not fighting for your own influence uh, in, those, in those regions? I mean, you are supposed to be way ahead there. You have the cultural knowledge, you have the, the, the history, and the history is not all bad. Uh, it's not all bad. Um, uh, it's just... I think it's just that uh, Europe committed suicide twice in the 20th century, uh, First World War and Second World War, uh, two suicides in a row. Uh, and it has played in our disfavor in terms of how we look at ourselves uh, uh, internally and also in relation to the world. Uh, we do not trust ourselves anymore. Uh, we believe that uh, we have nothing to bring to the world anymore, which means we're stuck with those uh, uh, just uh, lecturing countries on uh, human rights. I mean, uh, when you look at what the, the office of the European Union does, for example, in, even in countries like Japan, uh, they, they try uh, on a regular basis to lecture Japan uh, on the five or six or 10 people that they hang every year. Um, and then the Japanese reply, yeah, but how many people do you euthanize in Belgium every year without their consent? So uh, where is this discussion going? Um, so th that's the problem. Uh, we need to reinvent uh, ourselves. We need to uh, have a proposition uh, for the world. Uh, uh, thank God we are still democracies, uh, just like Japan. But if you compare, Japan is very interesting. It's a very interesting uh, example to compare us with. Uh, they've done much worse than us uh, during the Second World War. Um, uh, it has been uh, arguably even more of a disaster for them. Uh, they've been nuked twice. Uh, but if you look at uh, the way they've been presenting themselves to the world since then, uh, they've been showing that they are a very, uh, um, um, let's say, the Chinese are talking about win-win, the Japanese are doing win-win. Let's put it this way. Uh, they are being very benevolent. Uh, they are showing the world that they are happy to continue functioning along multilateral uh, uh, structures, uh, that they're not trying to break up the whole system. They're not trying to impose their relations. If you look at the influence that the Japanese are still, uh, are still enjoying in uh, the whole of uh, Southeast Asia, in spite 
of the historical uh, uh, of the historical background uh, that they have with those countries during the Second World War. It's it, it is quite uh, admirable, and um, I wish we had the same kind of influence in Africa, mm -hmm. in our ex colonies. And uh, we didn't do half, we didn't do half of what the Japanese did in Indonesia or in uh, or in uh, or in the Philippines or in uh, or in Malaysia. So um, I think uh, Japan should be an example for us in terms of uh, reinventing yourself and proposing something to the world. Uh, but it means that first of all you need to believe in yourself. And I, I'm afraid that uh, in Europe uh, our elites don't believe uh, uh, they don't believe in us, and, and it's creating a major shift. Uh, a major, sorry, a major rift between uh, populations and the elite. Uh, why are our elites in all European countries being elected with less and less votes every time? Is because the population doesn't believe that those elites are representing them properly. It doesn't believe that Brussels is uh, protecting, is acting in favor uh, of, uh, of uh, European influence and European power. And this is where the rift is coming from. David? It's interesting you're talking there about Japan's ability to put its past behind it and you know, Europe is struggling to do the same thing. It would seem to me one of the key differences here is that Japan had the same historical experience, had the same things to deal with, but dealt with them as a single country. Whereas really Europe didn't suicide, it fratricided. It killed its brothers and sisters. So there is an innate fear internally of killing its brothers and sisters again. So it's sort of a twofold problem here that, Europe is too big to be functional because it's trying to be nice to each other in order to not kill each other. So it, it's almost the perfect example of our earlier discussion that organizations shouldn't have more than so many countries in them if they want to function effectively. True, I, I totally agree with you, David. And, uh, and, I, and I think uh, the, the, the whole way that the EU has been built uh, from uh, 1945, uh, it's been built on the wrong foundations. Uh, um, it, it's been built on, first of all, it's been built on uh, uh, very different realities uh, and it's become even more apparent uh, when, uh, when the EU uh, extended to new members in Central Europe. Uh, the economic realities, the fiscal realities are so different that there is no way that something like the euro, for example, could properly reflect all those realities at the same time. So it's no surprise that the euro is only made, uh, is only be created to reflect the German economic reality and to serve German economic interests. But even uh, before the euro, uh, right from the start uh, in, the, in the late 1940s, um, I think the idea is that we wanted to put the war behind us so badly that uh, we, we went into this kind of dream uh, and I think it's becoming apparent now that it's, uh, it's a lie. We, we came into this dream that getting together, uh, doing commerce together uh, will keep us from going to war again. Uh, but this is not true. History shows us that this is not true. Trade does not prevent war. If anything, in many cases, trade justifies war. One example that I always give, but I think it's the most apparent, in 1913, uh, if you look at the trade intensity between Germany and the UK, uh, it was at its highest historical point. And one year later, they were butchering each other in the trenches of Northern France. Uh, uh, the Napoleonic Wars, why did the Napoleonic Wars end in Waterloo, in what is now Belgium, is because Belgium has always been uh, a, strategic, uh, a strategic ground in terms of economy, in terms of trade, that European nations have been fighting over. Uh, the estuary of the Esco River has always been extremely important both for continental powers and for England uh, when it comes to uh, exporting their goods. So they've always been fighting for this territory. So if anything, trade uh, is in many cases is a reason for, uh, for, uh, for war. Uh, don't, we don't forget how the war in the Pacific started with the embargo uh, on, uh, on the natural resources to Japan. Uh, Japan was feeling that they were cor being cornered uh, by the U.S. and by the international community on the uh, economic uh, on the economic uh, stage, uh, so they went to war over this uh, initially. So uh, I think this is a lie, and I think the French and the Germans uh, uh, were totally delusional uh, in in pushing this initially. Uh, the Germans, in reality, were uh, trying to build Europe to serve German economic interests. And the French were trying to build Europe to serve French political interests. Uh, going back to French history, France has been pretty much since the end of the Roman Empire, the one power in Europe that has been trying to resuscitate the Roman Empire. 
Charlemagne has been trying to resuscitate the Roman Empire. Uh, and uh, the coins that he had minted was Renovatio Romani Imperi to renovate the Roman Empire. Uh, up to Napoleon, Napoleon, even Louis XIV tried to resuscitate some sort of uh, Roman Empire, of course, dominated by France, up to Napoleon. Um, the Germans have always been interested in uh, uh, their economic power and they've been trying to build Europe as their economic power. And they're obviously winning. If you look at the nature of relationships between the EU and China now, it's being uh, controlled and directed by German economic power, not French political power. France is, uh, you know, speaking of war, France has been hard at work attempting to wipe out Muslim extremists in the Sahel area of Africa. Some academic literature says that endemic poverty in countries drives terrorism and state breakdown. Shouldn't France and the US see the terrorism problem in the Sahel from an economic rather than simply a military perspective? Uh, I could not say no to this. Uh, obviously, uh, the problem is that uh, we've tried that for many, 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 many years. Mm. Uh, the development assistance uh, was supposed to serve that purpose. It was supposed to stop uh, immigration waves into Europe. It's not working. And actually, many economists are showing now that the more uh, you send money uh, in uh, development assistance programs, actually, the more you, you have an incitation uh, for local populations to leave, uh, because it's, it reminds them that the money is over there. It's not, it's not uh, in, the, in the recipient country. And uh, basically, in those countries, the elites leave anyway, and the, the least educated people leave also. Very often, actually, uh, they're being pushed out by their own countries. Uh, Mali, Chad, they're very happy to see uh, some of their uh, lower class population try to go into Europe and get rid of these uh, of these populations. So um, uh, on paper, uh, theoretically, yes. Uh, in reality, at least our experience is that uh, it hasn't been working out at all. Uh, the billions and billions and billions of euros that we've been pouring into Africa over the past decades, it's not stopping anything. If anything, uh, the waves of immigrants are becoming stronger and stronger. Uh, I think um, much of it, it's a, it's a problem of attractiveness of uh, European societies uh, in those countries. When you have a, a country like France that guarantees a minimum social security to anybody that is on French soil, French citizen or not, uh, you can't beat that. You can't beat that. You can, uh, you can build all the wells you want in Africa. You can inject uh, all the money you want to start up like a small agricultural companies uh, in Africa. You will still have many Africans who want to go to France because going to France, you arrive there, you're entitled uh, to uh, a certain level of social security. You're entitled uh, to being, uh, to, being uh, um, um, to go to a hospital, uh, uh, all expenses paid if you have a, if you have a, a condition. You, you really can't beat that. So uh, until we start saying, okay, uh, social security will be for citizens only, which is the case in many countries. I mean, uh, I haven't seen any country in Asia uh, that guarantees social security with, to people who enter illegally. Um, uh, unless we start changing this, uh, our countries will always be more attractive uh, to those populations uh, versus staying in their own country and trying to uh, build on uh, whatever assistance that, uh, that uh, European countries uh, uh, give. Uh, and then there's a problem of uh, radical Islam. Uh, radical Islam, uh, I think there is another mistake that we're making is that uh, we, to me, we cannot win this war in, uh, in, uh, in Sahel. Uh, uh, French military operations over there have been going on for uh, over 10 years now. And we are the only, pretty much the only European power to shoulder uh, that effort. Uh, you don't see uh, German soldiers over there. You see very few Spanish soldiers, very few Portuguese soldiers, very few Italian soldiers. Pretty much uh, France on its own, trying to protect Europe against the spread of radical Islam at its doors. Uh, it's not working out. And uh, because it's a never ending chase, uh, uh, you kill one, 10 new, 10, uh, 10 new ones appear anyway, because the, 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 the conditions are, are so dire over there. Uh, and the problem is that we're fighting over there, but we're not doing much at home. And that's what worries me the most. Uh, so I would be very much in favor personally of uh, uh, bringing back much of our troops from the Sahel and redeploying them at home, because this is where the war is uh, being fought as well. 
and uh, there are worries of civil wars now. Uh, you may have heard that uh, 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 military officers have been sending open letters to the French government uh, trying, to, uh, trying to warn them about the state of French society, uh, the risk of civil war that is brewing. Uh, you've heard about the repeated uh, terror attacks that have been going on even uh, during uh, COVID-19. And now it's becoming very uh, low intensity attacks. It's just one guy with a knife uh, stabbing a cop, uh, one guy with a knife uh, uh, cutting the throat of an elderly lady in a church. Uh, it's, very, it's becoming very low intensity. And this is the new normal now in France. Uh, so I think the, 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 the battle has to be fought at home, uh, I think more, um, more aggressively so than, uh, than overseas. Uh, we cannot shoulder that, uh, that weight alone. Uh, the military, the only military strategy uh, is not a winning strategy. I mean, the, the US, uh, has learned that at its own expense in Afghanistan and, and, and everywhere else. Um, it's something that we need uh, to fight at home first and foremost. David? It's fascinating you talk about all of that because we have the amazing example of a, Thailand, a tiny island state, Mayotte, giving up its independence to become a department of France. Yep. Yeah. So we have France going, oh, well, we can, we can make you French. We can fit you in. We can make you fit this, this you know, fantasy of the post World War Two dream of the perfect, you know, democracy based on negotiation that takes too long. So yeah. everything you just said is unfortunately counterbalanced by yes, there was an old agreement, but the French Parliament still had to agree to incorporate something so incredibly foreign into the metropole. Absolutely. How are things like that perceived at the moment? It is a disaster. I mean, the example of Mayotte is an absolute disaster because it is one small French territory in the middle of a very uh, problematic region, uh, problematic in all the sense of the term, uh, uh, radical Islam, poverty, uh, uh, the spread of disease, uh, piratery, and et cetera, et cetera. And because it is French territory, anybody who succeeds in setting foot on that territory can claim asylum and can become part of this. Uh, if you look at uh, the, the data on, uh, on uh, uh, safety uh, issues in Mayotte, it's a disaster. It's an absolute disaster. The data on drug trafficking in Mayotte, it's an absolute disaster. So those are all uh, weak points uh, in, the, in the French territory. Uh, that's not the case for all territories. I mean, uh, French Polynesia is not causing uh, those, uh, those, uh, those issues. Uh, Guyana, uh, it, it is becoming, uh, it has uh, always been kind of a problem, but uh, we will not let it go because of its strategic positioning for launching satellites. Um, but Mayotte, is a, it's an absolute disaster. It is an absolute disaster. Um, and uh, I mean, pe people from uh, all neighboring countries go uh, to deliver babies in hospitals in Mayotte. Uh, the, 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 the child is born in Mayotte, French territory, so can claim French citizenship. And because of uh, uh, what we call regroupement familial, uh, family regrouping, uh, which, was, uh, uh, which was made uh, possible since the end of the 1970s, uh, any, uh, any person who has a child who is of uh, French nationality, because he's born on French soil, can claim also French nationality. So the, the whole family can become French. Um, it's, it, it's never ending. It's never ended. So, Nicholas, finally, um, since the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen more and more countries wanting to bring their industries back home from countries they originally outsourced to because of the cheap labour, which we touched on earlier. Is the ambition for recreating national sovereign capabilities a pipe dream? Or should we miraculously rid ourselves of COVID Will all nations drift back to more familiar settings in spite of the domestic, political and social unrest this may cause? Uh, I think it is definitely not a pipe dream, but it depends on who you're talking about. Uh, uh, when it comes to Asian powers, uh, the US, uh, definitely not a pipe dream. Uh, I do not believe that once COVID is gone, uh, and before the next pandemic comes, uh, that those countries will uh, revert to their old ways. Uh, uh, and actually, uh, to me, it's not so much the COVID uh, pandemic that has been uh, uh, driving this, uh, this new mindset. It's much more uh, the, the tech war, the technological war uh, uh, that was started uh, during the, the Trump administration, and which I believe uh, uh, was actually necessary. Uh, Trump uh, just uh, uh, said some truth very out loud in a very nasty way, but I think those truths needed to be heard, and now a new administration can build on this. Um, so I think this tech war and this necessity to build 
you know, what I would call a, a technological resilience or national resilience is very much, uh, is very much uh, at the forefront and it will, it will be there to stay. My biggest worry is for uh, middle powers like Europe. Uh, it all goes down to, again, it's always the same problem. Uh, do you believe in your own power? Do you believe in your own worth? And do you believe that you need to build this resilience? Uh, I'm afraid that Europe still has not, at, I mean, I'm talking about our leaders, still has not learned its lesson. Look at, uh, look at the details of the comprehensive agreement on investments that Europe was trying to sign with China at the very end of last year. Uh, I've read, I've gone through the details. Uh, we finally had the appendices uh, a couple of months ago, uh, it is a disaster. This, this agreement, I really hope, I pray that it will not go through. It looks like the European Parliament uh, will not pass it uh, because it's a disaster. Uh, it's totally unbalanced. China will have a, a lot of access, even freer access in terms of investment in technology in Europe. Uh, and there is absolutely no reciprocity. How can there be? How can there be? The systems of us are totally different. So I'm afraid that Europe is still extremely, our leaders are still being extremely naive. I think they're stuck in an ideology and there's nothing worse than being stuck in ideology because it makes you uh, oblivious of the realities. Uh, one uh, French author from the early 20th century, Charles Peggy, used to say that there is nothing harder than, uh, than uh, believing what you see the only thing harder than believing what you see is to actually see what you see. Uh, and I think our leaders refuse to see what they see. They refuse to see what is in front of them uh, mm. still. Um, they still believe that uh, uh, globalization can work. Uh, and it's exactly what they're telling us uh, in terms of uh, the functioning of the, uh, of the EU. Uh, when things don't work in the EU, when discontent uh, starts going through the roof, uh, the same answer comes back every time. That's because we didn't explain well enough, and that's because we didn't go far enough. Right. So we when the EU exactly doesn't work, it's because there's not enough EU. Uh, Nicholas, we have exactly the same case here in Australia. Uh, there is a level of political naivety in Canberra with regard to our own position in the world. I mean, you know, we are one of the world's greatest uh, commodity exporters. We have highly efficient extractive industries that can't be replicated in less developed economies. And for some unknown reason, in spite of this obvious power that we could manage our relations with China better, we've chosen not to. We've chosen to play the victim. You know, we let the Chinese run all over us and we don't push back in a way that says, hang on a tick, yeah, we may be 24 million strong in terms of population size, but you've got to come here to, the, to get our goods. And if you can't come here, if we deny you access to our raw materials, that then presents a problem for Chinese policymakers because then they have to divest all their interests in lesser developed extractive industry countries, right? So mm. yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying. It's, it's really quite extraordinary that the Europe and Australia, we may be geographically very separated, but uh, in terms of our mental outlook, we're very similar. Absolutely, absolutely. It's like uh, the, the medicine doesn't work is because you didn't take enough of that medicine. Take yeah, more. Exactly. Take more. Yeah. <laughs> David, final comments, questions? Just a fascinating thought, isn't it? That really the description of Europe and the description we regularly make of Australia is so similar. Yeah. Can't comprehend its own capacity, doesn't believe in itself, yeah. continues exactly. down the delusional path of ideology rather than facing reality. So we have the fascinating thing on the periphery of that, that the Brits have gone, uh-uh. Mm -hmm. Immaterial of how they got out of Europe was good, bad or ugly, they got out. Yeah. We've got a history with them so the interesting thing is going to be, they may not have done a great job of getting out of Europe, but at least they've indicated either they're going to go to an even more ideologically bizarre place or they're going to deal with reality. But either way, they're showing that change is possible. Yeah, absolutely. So ironically for, you know, for Australia and for Europe as a whole, recognizing that change is possible and that the historical delusion is not worth continuing is a big step forward. Yeah, and not being yep. afraid of the change either. You know, yeah. we've got this timid political elite here. It's like, oh, no, no, we can't even imagine. If we do imagine it, then it's going to break everything. And, you know, uh, what we have is worth preserving. Actually, no, what we have is not serving our interests anymore. We've grown beyond it. We do need to take it up a notch. But, you know, so long as we have the same kind of people and we keep on electing the same kind of people, because apparently they're the best people that our respective countries have, 
you're not going to get that kind of radical solution. Really. Well, that opens up a whole other kettle of fish, and that is all three of us are having this conversation, pointing out better answers, better ways of doing things. None of us have joined a party and stood for parliament because we can't bear <laughs> the idea. So there really is a deep problem within democracies. Yes, it, it, it is. Uh, I think the, the biggest problem is that the elites reproduce themselves all the time. Mm. Yeah. They reproduce themselves. It's the same ideology uh, generation yeah. after generation. I mean, if you look at all our uh, elite schools in France, uh, they're producing the same kind of elites over and over and yeah. over. Uh, if you have a different ideology, basically, you're not accepted in, in, into those schools. Uh, yeah. So you will not have that kind of impact, uh, politically speaking. So that's the problem. Uh, and now they're trying to uh, to play with this, uh, uh, President Macron in France uh, decided to dissolve the National School of Administration, which is the, the school that, um, that uh, trains uh, the, the, the future leaders uh, in France and its future administrative leaders in France. But they're going to create something else uh, uh, instead. In instead, so technically ENA will disappear, but a new school with a new acronym uh, will replace it, and, but the ideology will remain the same. Yeah. Actually, the interesting thing would that be, I would assume the original school would have been a spin-off of one of the things Napoleon created to genuine, you know, to create a genuinely meritocratic system of finding Absolutely. and promoting talent. So what Absolutely. this new one's going to be about is don't find and promote talent, mm -hmm. find clones of the people. So we're really seeing John Ralston Saul's argument from the late 1990s in unconscious civilization. We've got Absolutely. to a level of managers who just replicate yesterday Yep. can't imagine doing anything new and don't want to look at anything that's not familiar. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. God, what, a sad, what a sad, sad uh, way to sort of end this fascinating podcast on. But anyway, Nicholas, thank you very much for being our special guest on Strategicon. David, thanks again for your contributions. And to our audience, thanks for listening. We hope that you'll join us for our next exciting adventure through the world of geopolitics. Remember that you can subscribe to the audio version of Strategicon through the Ozcast Network, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Spotify. And please like us on the Sage International Facebook site and follow us on Twitter. We appreciate your support. You can also watch our podcasts on video through the Strategicon Raw YouTube channel when they're available, easily accessed by clicking on the link provided on our website. Also, please comment on any of our articles and podcasts through Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and of course, on the Sage International site. We welcome any constructive feedback that can help improve our products, and we look forward to engaging with our followers. If you would like to support Strategicon, remember to check out our merch page. We have a wide variety of items to keep the Strategicon listeners satisfied, like this t-shirt I'm wearing. It's a good t-shirt, buy it. Anyway, until next time, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.